down, David. We're talking about raffles. But ordinarily, when one thinks about uh, uh, pioneering explorers and uh, naturalists in Southeast Asia, of course, usually Alfred Russell Wallace will come to mind, and quite rightly so. But one should not forget that there were thousands of people contributing to the study of natural history in these past few hundred years or so. And so uh, raffles, it turns out, is one of them. And this is something that most people don't know and cannot even imagine because he's, a, he's, a, he's pictured as a, as a state statesman and, and various other things he's considered to be. So just a brief overview of, of the man himself. He was born um, in 1781 on the ship Anne off the coast of Jamaica. His father was the captain. They were not a wealthy family, and uh, Raffles went to a, a, a quite a modest boarding school from which he left at the normal age of 14 in 1795 and started working as a clerk in the East India Company in London. And it was through this company that by 1805 he was sent to Penang, and thus began his relationship with Southeast Asia. But already from his first stop, or the first, his first uh, station, he was already pursuing natural history. He kept animals, and he sent out collections, collectors to gather more. In 1811, of course, Napoleon had uh, conquered the Netherlands. Therefore, the Dutch East Indies, it was feared, would fall into the hands of Napoleon. The British chose to take them over for themselves. And Raffles was promoted way up the line to the role of Lieutenant Governor of Java. But there he began to pursue his natural history interests in earnest. And we know not only did he send home uh, large collections, but he kept two young tigers at his house, which I think shows that he was serious. <laughs> um, but he also uh, in instigated the exploration and uncovering and partial restoration of some of the great historic monuments in Java. And we have many of the, the sketches that survived from his team. The monuments were crumbling and overgrown. And Raffles wanted them to be surveyed, sketched, and preserved as, as far as possible. And these sketches you can see in the um, Raffles exhibition at the Asian Civilizations Museum right now. And most famous of all is Borobudur. This is a photograph from 1872, but it would have looked pretty much like this. When, we, when you go and visit these monuments today, they look fantastic. They look great. That's because they've been heavily restored and fixed and repaired for, for many years. But in the state in which uh, Raffles first uh, had them uncovered, they were an absolute wreck. They were piles of stones in many cases. And the longer the trees and the vines grew on them, the more the stones would be split apart. So he thought he was preserving these ancient monuments. The other thing that he did for natural history was he uh, promoted and sponsored some of the most important naturalists especially botanists in the region. Most notably, of course, Thomas Horsfield, Joseph Arnold, and Nathaniel Wallach. Now, in 1815, Raffles returned home. And two years later, he published his, his big book, two-volume History of Java. Now, this is meant to be a comprehensive account, but it has an entire chapter on the geography and natural history of Java. Again a central core interest of his uh, gets into print. Now, it was this book which showed that he was a man, not just an administrator and, a, and an officer of the company, but that he was a more serious scholar, with more serious ambitions and uh, great knowledge and learning, that sort of thing. And this led King George IV to uh, knight him, and hence he became Sir Stanford Raffles, as he liked to be known. He was posted again, this time to Sumatra in 1818, and as Lieutenant Governor of Vancouver. And this is a painting of his house on the hilltop, also from the exhibition at the Asian Civilizations Museum. Now, when he re re arrived back in Southeast Asia, here in Sumatra, his colleague, Horsfield, wrote that it was particularly gratifying to observe that the visit had not only increased the zeal and ardor of Sir Stanford in the promotion of every useful object, but it also directed his attention to many specific subjects of curiosity and interest in science. In natural history particularly, he had resolved not to rest satisfied in patronizing the labors of others, 
but likewise to afford his personal cooperation. So in other words, now that he had free time as the boss, he wanted not only to pay for other collectors uh, to go out and do, do work and to explore and to collect, but he was engaged more actively himself than he had in the past. Raffles himself wrote in 1820, notably after that 1819 year, which I won't mention. Uh, I have thrown politics far away, and since I must have nothing more to do with men, have taken to the, the wilder but less sophisticated animals of our woods. By the ship Mary, I have sent a most valuable collection in natural history. The greatest possible care has been taken to render the collection valuable and an appropriate accompaniment to that from Java. In other words, to the stuff I've already sent from my last posting. He went back and forth, of course, during this time. He made a, another visit to Singapore in 1823, during which time there must have been a lot of collecting going on, and w which we don't know that much about, but we know about the results. Because M Munshi Abdullah, his uh, scribe, uh, wrote uh, this detailed account of what uh, Raffles was going to ship out when he left Singapore in 1823. There were thousands of different creatures whose insides and bones had been taken out which had been stuffed with cotton wool so that they looked just like living animals. There were two or three chests filled with many kinds of birds. There were hundreds of bottles, large and small, tall and short, filled with snakes, centipedes, scorpions, worms, and so on. Two more chests were filled with coral. Interesting, marine life. Uh, Mr. Raffles prized all these specimens very highly, more than gold or diamonds. From time to time, he came in to look at them, for he was afraid of their being damaged or crushed, that is, just before they were shipped. Well, as many of you will know, uh, Raffles was setting sail again uh, for England in 1824 with the main part of his collection on board the ship Fame. And of course, Flame struck the Fame, and she caught fire and sank. And his entire collection, I mean, the result of thousands and thousands of man hours of work of so many people, was lost there. And along with many other things. I'm only talking about the natural history collection. Raffles wrote of this, this tragic loss later that the collection was intended to advance the state of natural knowledge and science. In natural history, the loss on this fire to myself and to science has been still greater. The, cho the choices, the cream and flour of all my collections, I retain to take under my personal charge, which included the 2,000 times he drawings. And having been taken from life, taken from life, the drawings, and with scientific accuracy, were executed in a style far superior to anything I had seen or heard of in Europe. In short, they were my pride. And it was all gone. What did he do? He returned back to Sumatra, and he immediately set to work trying to build it up again, even though it would be impossible to replace what was lost. But he had a team of Chinese illustrators he walked in every day, constantly all day long, uh, checking on what they were doing. And they drew uh, the following, which, which are fortunately preserved. And they are, as you can see, absolutely <coughs> exquisite works of art, as well as, as well as of science. And I'll just show you a short collection that survived. This one will look familiar because it's flying all over Singapore. Aren't they beautiful? This one should also look familiar. And this. And in addition to birds, there were several mammals. This is a sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, goat. Then there's the lovely named moon rat. And the delightfully charming Malayan tapir. And you can see that the artists have taken great care. Note the cute little three toes there. And it was not limited just to animals. Uh, plants, too, were illustrated extensively. Um, beautiful drawings, all hand-colored. And you can see why Raffles said that these were executed in a manner superior to anything I had seen in Europe. Nutmeg, and of course, everyone's favorite, durian. These drawings, by the way, you can find in the wonderful book, Raffles' Art Redrawn, which reproduces these. Now, of course, in Singapore, you can see something almost identical to what I just showed you in the William Farquhar collection of natural history drawings at the Natural History Museum, which has been uh, exquisitely um, uh, curated 
Farquhar, of course, uh, is a, an, another big part of the, the Singapore story. I'm not going to talk about Raffles and Farquhar, thankfully. But the collection shows that Farquhar, too, had a serious interest in natural history. But it would seem nowhere near the scale of Raffles, or perhaps he had nowhere near the resources of Raffles, because the size of one's collection often depends on how many collectors you can afford to send out to, to increase the size of your collection. But amongst these illustrations is one named after Raffles, at least it's called Raffles, uh, Raffles and Alcoa, another uh, exquisite drawing. But Wall uh, Wallace, I said, <laughs> Raffles is particularly remembered in natural history for having the largest flower in the world named after him, the Raffleisia Arnoldi. And uh, it is also the stinkiest in the world. <laughs> and I'm not sure if that also has to do with raffles. But uh, in any case, uh, yeah. Is it a dubious honor? I don't know. But uh, now there's been a lot of discussion about this naming recently. Because of course, the flower was collected by a Malay assistant and brought to Arnold. And raffles led the expedition. And people nowadays begin to question is that appropriate? Well, this is where I, as a historian, have, would like to step in and uh, contest some of these opinions. Because w what the historical standards were matters. Because the people in the past didn't play by our rules. So the local collectors were never uh, credited or named, or seldom. And the, the, the person who was actually the, the naturalist, who paid for a team of people to go with him and go mm -hmm. out, would be accredited for it. Or uh, the patron, say the person who paid for the expedition. Which is why we have so many things in the world named after kings and generals and emperors and so on. They didn't do anything, but they paid for it. <laughs> or perhaps they didn't do anything, but the person naming things after them was just trying to impress them in order to get some patronage in the future. It often works. I mean, it worked for Raffles with the book. Right? He got a knighthood. Anyway, but I want to point out that there is uh, a lot of precedent for this, because uh, Wallace's, Wallace's standard wing, a newly discovered bird of paradise, Wallace himself tells us in his book, was found by his Malay assistant, Ali, from Sarawak. That's named after Wallace. But no one would have ever batted an eyelid, not even Ali. That was the standard of the day. And uh, I've been working on Wallace and his assistants in the Malay Archipelago over the last few years. I wrote a paper recently. I wanted to find out how many people actually assisted Wallace in his collections and research. And as far as I can tell, and of course the historical evidence is very incomplete, but as far as I can tell, at least 1,200 people assisted Wallace in his collecting during his eight years in the Malay Archipelago. But that was how things were done, of course. So Raffles, in, in a way, is very similar. He is a, a patron as well as a practitioner. I mean, he's very knowledgeable, and he, he knows what he's talking about. But he's also got the means to increase the size of his collection by sending out more and more collectors. And many of these things ended up in European museums. As you can see here from the... Um, the British Museum of 1845, which museums then were a place for uh, the genteel to go and look at beautiful things from faraway places. But where do you think all these dead animals came from? From collectors, teams of collectors, armies of collectors. And these specimens were valuable because to get to the other side of the world was extremely difficult and extremely expensive. And 99.9999% of people would never see those other parts of the world. Today, we are spoiled with things like you know, the internet and television and, and color photography. We can see uh, beautiful things from all around the world whenever we want. But it wasn't possible in the past. Someone had to either make a drawing or a painting, as we have seen, or bring actual examples of dead ones and occasionally live ones. So raffles we um, remember as this towering, well, it's not quite towering, but anyway, <laughs> statuified figure uh, connected with, with Singapore. But he has another legacy, which is after he returned home 
to England in, in 1826, he wrote in a letter, I am much interested at present in establishing a grand zoological collection in London with a scientific society for the introduction of living animals. And the Zoological Society of London was founded in April 1826 by Raffles and, and others. Uh, and Raffles was appointed its first uh, chairman and president. Why him, of all the people who were patronized? Because he was the, the, the driving force who wanted this to be done. And he wanted the zoo, uh, sorry, the, the Zoological Society to have a garden. And the Zoological Society's gardens is what we now call a zoo, because we've shortened zoological gardens to zoo. But that's where that word comes from. But alas, uh, not that long after, uh, in July 1826, Raffles himself died unexpectedly. But his dream, his dream of a scientific institution to study the natural world uh, was realized. And here is an early uh, diagram of the zoological gardens. See where, yeah, the way they describe the gardens of the Zoological Society in Regent's Park. And the Zoological Society um, has a plaque, which I'm sorry is not very clear on this slide, but commemorating the fact that he was the, the first president of the society. So the zoo, in these early days, looked something like this, which I suppose these won't look very familiar to you, or very, very zoo-like. And of course, that early uh, zoo wasn't very zoo-like in our terms. The, the, society, the, the society's gardens were only open to fellows. They weren't open to the public for many years. So they really were intended for, for serious scientific research. They weren't there to entertain or to educate the public. They were there for ser serious naturalists, fellows of the zoological society to study animals, to study their behavior, to study their anatomy, and so on. So these enclosures nowadays, I mean, this would all be illegal because <laughs> none of them have enough room and, and so on. Um, have another, oh, I didn't use that illustration. Have another one where there's a, there's a bear. Yeah, here it is, yes. There's a bear on a pole, right? He, he lives in a big pit, but there's a big wooden pole which the bear can climb up to sort of look at the visitors. And here's a visitor with a stick sort of taunting him. <laughs> which was, uh, there might be, there might be um, some bread on it, I'm not sure, but anyway. It was acceptable to do that in those days, apparently. Of course, the London Zoo has somewhat modernized since then. But not all of it. This is uh, Desmus Burton's giraffe house. It is the oldest zoo building in the world still being used for its original purpose. <clears throat> now, what was special about it was not just the fact that it had really tall doors so a giraffe could walk through without knocking its brains out, but was that it was heated. And this allowed animals from warmer climates to hopefully sometimes be kept alive in the uh, colder climate of, of uh, southern England. And this is where I have a surprise for you. And it involves this building, this heated giraffe house. Since it's Darwin Day, I thought I would unveil a connection between Raffles and Darwin. Hmm. It's ten, okay, it's a tenuous one, but, but anyway. But it involves this building. So Raffles established the, the gardens and uh, this heated giraffe house. But it didn't just house giraffes, it was basically lots of other kinds of animals that would die if they were left out in the cold. And these included orangutans. And one of these was famously known as Jenny. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about when Darwin met Jenny. <laughs> in 1838, Darwin, as a fellow of the society, of course, can go in there and interact with the animals. It's not like today where you were behind bars. Right, the animals are behind bars, you're not there. Anyway, he wrote this letter to his sister. The keeper showed her an apple, but would not give, this is actually Jenny, by the way. The keeper showed her an apple, but would not give it to her, whereupon she threw herself on her back, kicked and cried, precisely like a naughty child. She then looked very sulky, and after two or three fits of passion, the keeper said, Jenny, if you'll stop bawling and be a good girl, I will give you the apple. And Darwin says, she certainly understood every word of his, and though like a child she had great work to stop whining, she at last succeeded, and then got the apple, with which she jumped into an armchair and began eating it, 
with the most uh, contented countenance imaginable. So Jenny was happy there. But Darwin wasn't there simply to amuse himself by watching the orangutans. He was there for research purposes. And Darwin, of course, in 1838, was just starting out uh, on his theory of evolution. And he had gone to see Jenny as the only possibility of seeing a living great ape, which he already believed that the great apes were our closest living relatives. And so by observing Jenny, he thought that he could find clues as to what we might have in common with them and what we might not have in common with them, what, what differences might there be. But he was clearly looking, as you can kind of see there, he's, he's, he's put, we would say this in very anthropomorphic terms, that he's described her in very human-like terms. You can hardly blame her, she's got clothes on. Um, and uh, to amuse visitors, I mean, they'd have her drink cups of tea and then sit in chairs and things like that. Um, yeah, it is anthropomorphizing. But with Darwin, I think, we shouldn't go quite so far, because it's not really anthropomorphizing if you believe that both you and that are almost the same. So he's not mistakenly attributing uh, human characteristics to his dog, as most of us do, or to your cat. Right? Oh, my cat loves me. No, it doesn't. It's hungry. Right? <laughs> um, but a cat is quite different from a human. But an orangutan or a chimpanzee, they're very similar. And Darwin is looking for these evolutionary links. So what I'm going to show you next is the, um, this letter is very famous. It's been published for over 100 years. But there's also a, a, a few sheets of paper on which Darwin took notes while he was with Jenny that remains in the Darwin Archive at Cambridge University Library, which I published for the first time a couple of years ago. And I'll just read you a couple of extracts, which I think will surprise you about Darwin's interaction with Jenny. So. First of all, he calls the notes on man. They're not characterized as orangutan notes. They're characterized as on the subject of mankind. He goes on to say, she was like a child, and when annoyed and curious, particularly fond of watching boys bathe. <laughs> so Jenny, well, she was a female. Um, furthermore, Darwin says, she tried to strike me and showed teeth when I tried to plague her with showing her food and not giving it to her. So he was taunting her, uh, teasing her, and not giving it, but he wanted to see how she would react. And finally, she followed me and bit me for, I, for I having taken the handkerchief away, and she tried to pick my pocket. This is a new revelation, that Charles Darwin almost had his pocket picked by an orangutan. <laughs> now this, me this meeting of Darwin and Jenny has become quite famous, particularly because of its role in the, the 2009 film Creation. I mean, there it is, the movie poster, uh, as well as the soundtrack. They use this photograph of Paul Bettany, who plays Darwin, uh, you know, uh, touching fingers with Jenny. This is, of course, reminiscent of uh, the famous uh, Sistine Chapel in Adam and, and God. The problem is that the subtitle of this film, Creation, is The True Story of Charles Darwin. I'm sorry to say that that's a little bit inaccurate. The only thing true in this film are the names of the people. <laughs> there really was a Charles Darwin and Emma Darwin and Huxley and, and, and a Jenny and so on, but everything else in that film is entirely fictional, in which everything revolves around a, an imagined, made up conflict between Darwin and his wife uh, about religion and his theory. There was no such thing, it did not exist. There's a, a famous point in which the actor playing Huxley is trying to encourage Darwin to publish his theory. And he says, you've killed God, sir. He says it twice, actually. <laughs> no, no, he never said that. And he didn't think like that. But by projecting this fake story of Darwin to modern audiences, it makes it more difficult for people to uh, accept uh, evolutionary theory. Right. It was easier for the Victorians because they weren't so bound up into these, uh, these fake camps that we think the world is divided up into, into uh, religious people and uh, scientific people or secular people. In fact, most of the people back then were both, as indeed was rapids. So, with that, 
my story comes to an end. So thank you, <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. John, for a very informative and interesting presentation. We'll now proceed to have a 25-minute Q&A. Uh, if you have a question for Dr. John, please raise your hand and a uh, volunteer will pass a microphone to you. In order to give everyone enough opportunities to ask questions, I would like to request uh, members in the audience to ask questions and not give speeches. <laughs> 